Welcome to No, a small town located in the south of Seward Peninsula on the west coast of Alaska. If you live here, I'll bet you say there's no place like Nome. Well, maybe not. It's cold and snowy here, and no roads connect this town with other settlements. And with the onset of night, locals have disappeared here without a trace. Perhaps that's why only 3,500 people live here. Well, let's investigate this case. People disappear in cities for assorted reasons. But it was Nome who attracted the attention of the public. From 1960 to 2004, some 24 people went missing there. That number is statistically too big for such a small population. People just didn't come home in the morning, and no one knew what had happened to them. All the locals in small towns like Nome know each other. There are almost no strangers here, as it's difficult to get to Nome. There are no roads and no ferry crossing. All roads from Nome break off and lead to beautiful natural landscapes unspoiled by human mammals. You can get there and back by plane. And this is not some passenger jet, but a small biplane. Another way to get there is by snowmobile. By the way, Nome is the ultimate point of the famous dog sled race, the Iditarod. Also, you can pay locals from neighboring villages and towns to bring you to Nome by motorboat. But despite this, the town has become quite famous. The frequent disappearance of people finally got needed attention. The whole world found out about Nome, and in 2009, Hollywood even made a movie about it. For a long time, no one could solve the mystery. The police had no clues, no witnesses, nothing. There are long, cold nights here in winter, and the air becomes so cold that a glass of water freezes in minutes. Snow can fall constantly. Therefore, if someone leaves the town at night, snow will sweep all traces away by the morning. Of course, people began to come up with their own theories. The most popular one was about someone who took people away by force. The police didn't find any evidence that some person could do it. So, if it's not a human, it could be some beast. And again, police found no evidence to support this version. After that, people started thinking that creatures from other planets caused these disappearances. Many locals were sure that the town was a popular destination for extraterrestrial spaceships. The plot of the Hollywood movie The Fourth Kind was based on this version. More time passed. Finally, the police and the FBI launched a large-scale investigation, and they uncovered the truth. They realized that the stories about missing people were exaggerated. The popularity of Gnome and the constant talk about fantastic things made people believe in the reality of these versions. Now, let's assume that some of the appearances were made up. But still, many people are gone. What about them? The answer is bars and harsh weather. Entertainment venues are open at night. Some locals have fun, leave the bar, and go home. At this moment, a heavy snowstorm begins. Visibility drops to zero, and the strong wind knocks you down. This way, a person might simply get lost. And that's it. The truth turned out stranger than most versions. The Bermuda Triangle is a big area in the Atlantic Ocean, so the disappearance of ships and planes there seems not so surprising. But it's much creepier when it happens on a lake. Let's visit the Lake Michigan Triangle. It's located between Michigan and Wisconsin. For a couple of centuries, terrible things have been happening here. People put the same legends around this place as around the Bermuda Triangle. They reported unexplained phenomena and saw flying objects above the lake surface. Some believe that the triangle is a time portal. Of course, no theories have been confirmed, but strange cases have occurred on the triangle territory. One happened in 1950, when a Northwest Airlines plane with 108 passengers disappeared without a trace during a flight over the lake. Police officers saw a red light over the lake two hours after the plane's last communication. The aircraft probably crashed, but rescuers didn't find any passengers or wreckage. All that's left was just an oil stain on the water. Many ships and boats disappeared there. But one of the strangest cases occurred on April 28, 1937. It was midnight. One ship was sailing through this lake. 
Captain George Donner went to sleep in his cabin after a hard day's work. Three hours later, the vessel was approaching the port. One of the crew members went to the captain's cabin to wake him up. The door was locked from the inside. The assistant knocked, but no one answered. When he suspected that something had happened to the captain, the assistant unlocked the door. He got into the cabin, but there was no captain there. He seemed to have disappeared into thin air. The crew couldn't find him. Since then, the eerie disappearance of Captain George Donner remains unexplained. Meet David Paulides. In 2008, he finished his career as a police officer and began to study the mysterious disappearance of people in Europe, the USA, and Canada. He found out that most people went missing in the U.S. national parks. Over the past 150 years, more than 1,100 tourists have vanished there. Many of them were experienced travelers who knew how to survive in harsh wild conditions. David has written about these mysterious vanishings. He pointed out that some of them didn't disappear, but were found alive. They woke up somewhere in the forest and didn't remember what had happened to them. The creepy detail of all these cases is that most missing persons were young. Another detail is that many went missing before hurricanes. There are too many riddles and not enough answers in this case. Then there's the Sargasso Sea in the northern part of the Atlantic Ocean. This is the only sea that doesn't have shores on land. It's called the sea only because it's defined by ocean currents. Also, golden brown algae grow in this area's bottom, making it seem like an orange spot in the middle of the endless ocean. The Sargasso Sea became famous because, in the 19th century, one of the most famous phantom ships in history sailed here. In 1872, a brigantine sailed through the Sargasso Sea. Its captain spotted another ship a few miles away. He lit a signal fire, but received no response. Then the captain decided to sail closer to find out what had happened. On the hull of the mysterious ship was the name Mary Celeste. The captain of the brigantine and several crew members went on board. They walked around the deck and looked into the cabins and the hold. Everything was in place, but there were no people. The cargo and barrels remained untouched, so pirates didn't attack the vessel. The only damaged thing on the ship were the sails. They were torn to shreds. All documents except the logbook were missing from the navigator's cabin. The last logbook entry was added on November 24, 1872. The crew of the ship was never found, and this was one of many cases. In the 20th century, from the 60s to the 80s, there were many reports of empty boats and yachts floating on the sea. Also, some entire ships disappeared without a trace. All these cases still remain a mystery. According to one version, the four-sided current forms water funnels. Whirlpools can quickly pull a ship into the depths of the sea. This explains the disappearance of boats. But what about cases when the vessel is still on the water without a crew? Sometimes these whirlpools can create wind vortices. They're like little tornadoes. What if these whirlwinds are powerful enough to throw people overboard and tear the sails? Yeah, the theory seems too fantastic. So, what do you think happened? The dark days are mysterious natural phenomena that have occurred only a few times in the history of humankind. We can write them off as eclipses or just some weather events, but in reality, they're very creepy and we have no idea why they happen. So, what are these dark days anyway? What's so strange about them? Let's try to find out. The sun is off. What are we gonna do? That's what the residents of Yamal, Siberia asked meteorologists on September 18, 1938. In the morning, instead of going to work, they all gathered at the weather station. They were waiting for answers. All because on that day, they observed something inexplicable, an eclipse which they later nicknamed the Black Day. And neither astronomers nor meteorologists can explain what happened back then. Here's how one of them described this event. At 8.30 a.m., we noted a decrease in light. At the same time, the color of the clouds began to acquire a yellowish-brown, sometimes red-brown hue. By 9 a.m., the lighting had changed dramatically. It was as if you were looking at the world through a dark light filter. 
the brown tones of the clouds intensified. By 10.30 a.m., the sky and Earth didn't differ from each other in lighting and color. Everything seemed homogenous, black, absolutely devoid of light. Pretty creepy, right? And that's not all. The city was also plunged into complete radio silence. Meteorologists couldn't even contact the authorities, and local residents were unable to set up any stations. Everyone was in the dark, both literally and figuratively. Meteorologists decided to try and launch several flares. The flares soared into the air towards the heavy dark clouds hanging over the city and disappeared. The clouds were so dense that the flares were completely invisible. At the same time, the weather was perfectly fine. Everything was quiet. And this black silence lasted for about an hour. After that, the black day ended as unexpectedly as it began. Even more baffling, those strange clouds left literally no trace. No rain, no dust, nothing. After that event, researchers found out that the black day had spread for 125 to 155 miles around. They also learned that the dark band was moving from west to east. After passing through the southern part of the Yamal Peninsula, it headed on for a while and then disappeared completely. Yamal isn't the only place where this phenomenon occurred. In fact, similar eclipses have been happening in different parts of Earth for many years. For example, in New England, on May 19, 1780, People there witnessed an event that was later called New England's Dark Day, but it lasted not one day, but several. A few days before this event, the sky turned yellow, and on May 19th, in broad daylight, it suddenly turned black. Here's what one of the witnesses, Joseph Plum Martin, later told the press. It was very dark. People had to light candles in their houses to carry on with their usual business. The night was as uncommonly dark as the day was. The smell of soot rained in the air. Nearby rivers were covered with a thin layer of ash. When the real night came, people noticed through the clouds that the moon had turned dark red. Only a couple of days later, people were finally able to see stars through the veil of clouds. And then everything suddenly returned to normal. No one had any idea what had happened. 22 years later, on June 2nd, 1802, a schooner named El Dorado sailed across the Pacific Ocean. Suddenly, they were overtaken by complete darkness. There was no storm, and the ocean was completely calm, but the whole sky was covered with black clouds. These clouds dissipated after half an hour and left no trace. And again, 74 years later, one of the dark waves happened in Wisconsin on March 19, 1886. It was 3 p.m., and this time, the wave was very short. It lasted only five to 10 minutes. A sudden night fell on the city. Frightened horses were neighing and terrified people were running around trying to find a place to hide. When everything calmed down, local newspapers reported that the wave passed from west to east. There was no solar eclipse, no winds or hurricanes, nothing that could cause the darkness over the city. And finally, once again, it happened on December 2nd 1904 in Memphis. Or rather, that's what rumors claim, since there's no scientific evidence of this event. It was clear and cold dawn over Bluff City. People were doing their usual Friday morning chores. Then, around 9 in the morning, without any warning, the sun suddenly disappeared from the sky. It took only a minute for the bright sunny day to turn into pitch darkness. People interrupted their work and children in schools were completely terrified. And just like in previous cases, the weather was perfectly calm. It lasted for about half an hour and then suddenly ended. A little later, following a mysterious eclipse, a ferocious storm hit the city. So, what's going on? All these strange cases can surely be explained scientifically, right? Well, actually, scientists don't have a definite answer. All these events are very similar, but we don't have a single explanation that could cover them all. Let's take a look at some theories. The first thought that comes to mind, it's probably a partial or total eclipse, but no, this is not the case. There were no eclipses on those days, and even if we consider this theory, 
before any eclipse, the sky darkens gradually. Eclipses themselves only last a couple of minutes, certainly not a few hours or even days. Also, unlike eclipses, these events were local to specific cities. Well, maybe it's some other astronomical event. Some scientists believe that during the event on Yamal, a band of cosmic dust touched Earth. But later, they found out that no astronomical bodies approached the planet that day. All right, any other ideas? Forest fires could be the reason. When a large area of forest is burning at the same time, a column of air can rise to great heights, like three to four miles. These air flows carry ash and other burnt stuff to different places. And since all these things are so high in the sky, they simply freeze there and turn into something resembling black clouds. That was probably the case for New England. At that time, a wave of forest fires broke out in Canada. They could easily spread through the north of the US. Also, just look at this description. Yellowed sky, the smell of soot, ash on the water. Everything sounds logical, but this theory of fires only works for the event in New England. What about the other cases? Where would you find a forest fire in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, for example? All right, moving on. Scientists tried to explain the story from Memphis by saying it could be a hurricane, but the black cloud swept through the city before the storm, not during or after it. And it wasn't some kind of typical storm cloud, it was full-fledged night darkness. So what's really going on? Now, meteorologists call this phenomenon a local decrease in the transparency of the atmosphere. Unlike solar eclipses, this darkness is denser. It also covers only a small area. The transparency of the atmosphere is its ability to let through radiation and light. It's basically, how well can I see distant objects? Everything can get dark and blurry, for example, because of the dust in the air, volcanic eruptions, fogs, and so on. So, according to this theory, dark days are just an extreme drop in the transparency of the atmosphere. But it's still strange. If that's the case, shouldn't everything have been covered with thick fog or something like that? Yeah, it was very dark. But when people lit the lamps, the visibility was pretty good. Nothing blocked the view except the black clouds that covered the sun. In other words, this phenomenon is very hard to explain. As far as we know, it happened only five to six times in the history of humankind. If there were other cases, they weren't documented. This phenomenon is impossible to predict and no one knows how it worked, as well as where and when it will happen next time. And although there are many hypotheses, none of them can be verified. Maybe if these events happen again in the future, we'll be able to study them better. But unfortunately, at the moment, the dark days remain a mystery. The theory of parallel worlds has been discussed in the scientific community for a very long time. Unfortunately, we're not developed enough yet to prove or disprove it. But it's still an interesting theory, and that's why we have a lot of unusual urban legends about the guests from a parallel reality, according to many. Let's check out a few of them. A man from a non-existent country. This story took place in 1851 in a small German village, Frankfurt an der Oder. A lost man came out to the local villagers asking for help. The man introduced himself as Jopar Voren. He spoke very poor German and had a very strong accent. The man himself claimed that he speaks Laxar and Abram languages that don't actually exist on our earth. He claimed to be from Laxaria, a country on the mainland called Sacria, separated from Europe by a huge ocean. However, none of these places existed on the Earth's map. People sent Yopar to the local authorities. He talked to a psychiatrist, but the doctor concluded that the man was totally sane. An investigation by the local police also revealed nothing suspicious about him. Jopar Voren claimed that the purpose of his visit to Europe was to find his long-lost brother. He survived a shipwreck and found himself near the village. They showed him a map of the world and a globe and asked him to indicate the place where he crashed, but he didn't recognize anything familiar. He seemed to have extensive knowledge about his homeworld. Jopar named five main continents on it, Sakria, Aflar, Ostar, Auslar, and Uplar. 
his story was considered plausible. Scientists from Frankfurt decided to send the man to Berlin for further research. However, during the trip, he had something like a seizure. The man suddenly jumped out of the carriage and disappeared into the surrounding forest. Despite a long and thorough search, no traces of Jokhar were found. He seemed to have disappeared as mysteriously as he had appeared. Inspector Leboeuf, who was assigned to escort him to Berlin, thought this man could be a being from another world and that he had returned from where he had come from. Lady on Highway 167 This incident happened on October 20, 1969. It was first reported in 1988 in the magazine Strange. The article tells about two men, L.C. and his business partner, Charlie. The names are fictitious. One afternoon, L.C. and Charlie were driving along Highway 167 in southwest Louisiana. Discussing work, they drove toward the oil center of Lafayette. The highway was empty at first, but then the men noticed a very old and very slow car ahead. The men started discussing this mysterious car. Such cars hadn't been produced for several decades, but this one looked quite new. The men thought it was thanks to the owner's care and admired it. They slowed down to get a better look at the car. L.C. noticed a bright orange sign on it that said 1940. They saw a driver. It was a young woman in old-fashioned clothes, a hat with a long feather and a fur coat, even though it was warm outside. There was a child next to her, also dressed in a warm coat and a hat. L.C. and Charlie wanted to talk to her, but then they noticed the expression on her face. The woman was looking around in panic, almost on the verge of crying. L.C. called out to her and asked if she needed help. She nodded, and he gestured for her to park on the side of the road. But when the men also parked, they suddenly noticed that the woman's car had disappeared. They looked around the highway in shock. She couldn't have gone somewhere far so fast, but the car was nowhere to be found. After some time, another man drove up to L.C. and Charlie. He saw everything that happened and claimed that the car had simply disappeared. The men talked about the incident for several hours. When they reached the city, they contacted the police. However, the police couldn't help them in any way. Apart from their words, there was no confirmation of the existence of the car. The case was discussed for a while in local newspapers, and then was forgotten. The Gadianton Canyon Incident This incident occurred in May of 1972 in southeastern Utah near the Modena Railroad Crossing on the edge of the Escalante Desert. Jenna North was driving her father's 1971 Chevrolet Nova. Her friend, Carol Abbott, was in the passenger seat. In the back seat, there were two other girls, Lisa Rockford and Bethany Gordon. It was after 10 p.m. when the girls crossed the Utah-Nevada state line. They wanted to get back to campus before their housekeeper, Mrs. Mortensen, locked the dorm doors. This stretch of Highway 56 in Utah is pretty deserted. There's nothing there but sand and a few plants. The girls were very happy when they finally noticed the Union Pacific Railroad crossing in Modena. But right behind the railing, Jenna noticed two highways. One went into the desert, and the other to Gadianton Canyon. The girls decided to take the road to the canyon. They thought it would be a shortcut to campus. The other girls were chatting with each other when Jenna noticed that they were no longer driving on asphalt, but on white cement. Watch out, suddenly shouted one of the girls. The road ended abruptly at a high rock wall. It was a dead end. They had to go back the same way they came here. And while Jenna's friends were complaining that now they would have to sleep in the car, Jenna saw that the landscape had changed dramatically. They weren't in the desert anymore. Instead, the canyon turned into an open area with wheat fields, pine thickets, and a small lake ahead. A full moon was shining in the sky, which was strange because it shouldn't have been there that night. The girls had no idea where they were, so they just drove to the light ahead. It was some building that they thought was a diner or restaurant. The girls saw a bright neon sign, but none of them could read what was written on it. These symbols were unlike any language they knew. Suddenly, Several people came out of the building. They seemed shocked and frightened by Jenna's Chevrolet. 
They waved their hands and shouted something, but the girls didn't understand them. Lisa decided to ask the men for directions. She stuck her head out of the window and immediately let out a terrifying scream. Get out of here, she shouted to Jenna. The Chevrolet sped away from the building. Bright headlights illuminated their car from behind. They were being chased by a few vehicles. These vehicles were egg-shaped, had three wheels, and made a buzzing sound. The road ahead led back to the canyon. Jenna didn't have time to slow down and crashed right into it. The vehicles had disappeared together with an unfamiliar landscape. The girls were back in the desert again. Fortunately, none of them were hurt, physically. But Lisa was in a state of shock. She was saying again and again, they weren't human. The girls had to help her walk. An hour later, they were able to stop a Utah Highway Patrol car. They told the police their story. The details of the report compiled by the police officer were complicated and confusing. During the investigation, the police couldn't figure out from the tire tracks exactly where the car went astray. The tracks ended very abruptly, as if the Chevrolet had suddenly disappeared. The police couldn't explain how the car could have driven two miles without leaving any traces, especially on such solid ground. There are still disputes about this story, but in the end, all versions and explanations of what happened are just guesses. Perhaps we'll never find out the truth. These were the urban legends about interdimensional traveling. Of course, there's no proof that any of these stories are real. Often the truth turns out to be very mundane. For example, the famous man from Taurid, who people also called a guest from another reality, turned out to be a simple fraudster named John Allen Kuchar Zegrus. But even so, these stories are still very interesting. There's a heavy snowstorm. The cold penetrates his bones. His legs are almost knee-deep in snow. Experienced hunter Joe LaBelle makes his way through the forest, covering his face from the headwind. Any other person would have already fallen and screamed in despair, but not Joe LaBelle. He can survive in any circumstances and always knows what to do. Right now, he's heading to one of the villages in the far north of Canada. This small settlement is located on Lake Anjakuni. The inhabitants of this village are Inuit, indigenous people of North America. Joe hasn't eaten or drunk for a long time. He needs a good sleep and a hot meal, which he hopes to get from the hospitable Inuits. Through trees and a white haze, he notices the silhouettes of tents. Smoke is coming from some houses. Joe will probably get there in time for lunch. He reaches the village, and at this moment, the wind calms down. The blizzard has ended. The hunter speeds up and goes toward the village, located along the frozen lake. It's strange, but there are no locals anywhere. Probably everyone is just sitting in their houses, waiting out the blizzard. Hello, Joe says loudly, but gets no response. Oh, great, smoke is coming out of this tent. Joe knocks on the wall, but no one opens it. He knocks a few more times and goes inside. The little tent is empty. All things are in their places. There's a piece of cloth with needles and thread on the table. Firewood is smoldering in the fireplace. It seems that people have just left this place. Joe goes into the next tent and sees the same picture. All things are in their places, but there are no people. Joe walks past the tents and sees a pit where a bonfire once burned. There's a rope above it with the meat that the Inuit were cooking hanging on it. For some reason, they didn't eat it. Lake Anjakuni is part of a chain of waterways. Here, the Inuits fished and traded various goods. Usually, there are many people here, but now something has forced them to leave their homes. Why did they leave their things behind? And where did they go? There are no tracks around the village. All the sleds are in place. The Inuits have even left their dogs here. And dogs help them to hunt and ride sleighs. No one will leave warm clothes and dogs here when moving away, especially in severe weather. Joe LaBelle knows all this, so he concludes that something terrible has happened here. His body is shaking, not from the cold, but from fear. After going around the entire settlement, 
he finds not a single soul. Terrified, he leaves the village, heads for the nearest telegraph pole, and sends a message to the police. After a while, more and more people arrive. The police are trying to find traces of missing people and figure out what has happened. But there's nothing. Near the village, they find an empty grave. During the ceremony, the Inuits placed stones around the burial site. The rocks around the open pit lie untouched, which means it wasn't an animal that dug it up. But who or what needed it? About 30 people lived in the village, and they're all gone. Local residents from neighboring villages can't help, since they have no idea what has happened. The only thing that the police have noticed is unusual blue lights. In this area, the northern lights are a common phenomenon. People living here regularly see a glow in the starry sky. But the police have seen something else, pulsing blue lights. Also, other hunters have witnessed something similar. They say that some strange things were flying in the sky. This all happened in 1930. It's been almost 90 years since the disappearance of the village, and people have created a bunch of theories. The most popular of them is an attack of an extraterrestrial civilization. According to this theory, the blue lights in the sky that the locals and the police saw were spaceships. Some believe that one ominous night, these ships flew to the settlement and took away all the people. In addition to these sci-fi versions, there were also more realistic ones. Internet users have found out that Joe LaBelle didn't have a hunting license. Maybe he wasn't a professional and made it all up. But at that time, many hunters didn't have a license, so Joe's words may be true. But if we try to find out where all this information came from, we'll see that the primary sources were books and some newspaper articles from the 30s. But none of them can confirm that the mysterious story of Lake Anjakuni is true. Perhaps this entire story was made up. Now let's leave the snows of Canada and head for the hot plains of India. In this big country, there's one sinister village where people also disappeared without a trace. This happened in the first half of the 19th century. Still, locals avoid this place even now because they believe that invisible evil forces live there. Let's check and find out what happened to the village of Kuldara. It's located in the district of Rajasthan. To get there, you can use a taxi to get to the nearest village or city. The village is located far from other settlements. It looks deserted. There are only ruins. It looks like archeologists have recently dug this place out of the ground and left it here. But this is not an ancient city. The village was abandoned more than 200 years ago. But up to that point, this place had been thriving. Kuldara was a large village. Local people were mostly farmers. They sold their agricultural products. And then, one night, everything changed. People abandoned their homes and stuff and ran away from there. No one knows why they did it and no one knows where they went. Nobody has ever seen the inhabitants of Kuldara again. Apart from tourists, almost no one comes here. The locals are sure that the village is cursed and is the center of paranormal activity. If you ask residents of other nearby towns or read the information on the internet, you'll learn a couple of legends about this place. One popular version says that people left this village because of a lack of water However, this version doesn't explain why the residents did it overnight and left their things behind. According to another version, the villagers ran away to save the daughter of the Kuldara chief. One local ruler fell in love with her and wanted to marry her. He threatened the locals with grave consequences if the girl rejected him. The ruler gave them one day to make a decision. The residents disagreed with such a requirement. As a sign of solidarity, they decided to leave the village together with the chief and his daughter. But if this is true, why did no one else see these people? They must have escaped to another settlement. In addition, 
they needed their things on the way there. The stories of Kuldara and Lake Anjakuni have one thing in common. People left a comfortable and safe place for an unknown reason. A similar story happened in Ireland with a small village on the island of Ackle. About 40 simple houses made of stone and straw were located along the valley of Keem Bay. The village was mentioned in documents dated back to the 1830s as a group of small buildings. But today, there's practically nothing left of it except pieces of walls and small mounds of ground. People from other settlements don't remember this village, but we know about it thanks to the records of travel writers. They describe the incredible beauty of this place and the village in their diaries. Students of the local archaeological school tried to find the answers. They started excavations and discovered that the villagers could have left the village because of hunger or some disease. If you ever fly over the deserts of southern Peru, you'll notice distinct white lines against the rusty red background. Look closer and you'll see some clear shapes. Straight lines, rectangles, triangles, swirls. It seems like they're parts of huge drawings. You notice a monkey, a whale, a condor, a hummingbird, and whatnot. The lines were created more than 2,000 years ago by the people of the Nazca culture. Thanks to a dry climate and strong winds in the desert, most of the Nazca lines are visible today. To create them, the Nazca people removed the top layer of pebbles and revealed the soil beneath the ground. The color of the soil changes from reddish brown to yellowish gray, so the lines always look different. It looks like the creators of the lines started with small scale models and increased the proportions to create full scale designs. Scientists have tried to decipher the meaning of the Nazca lines ever since they were first discovered in the 1920s. But the first mention of the lines was actually much earlier, in the 16th century Chronicle of Peru, where they were described as trail markers in the desert. Since you can't really study the lines and their symbolism from the ground, the lines became world famous only in the 1930s with the advent of commercial planes. A decade later, American professor Paul Kosak was doing his research on the lines and noticed one interesting thing. When he looked up from the line, it was pointing directly at the setting sun. It happened one day after the winter solstice, and the scientists concluded that the lines must be the largest astronomy book in the world. German scientist Maria Reicha, who got the nickname the Lady of the Lines, supported the theory that the geoglyphs served as a calendar and had some sort of astronomical purposes. She dedicated 40 years of her life to studying the lines and swept them inch by inch. She also moved into a small house close to the lines to protect them from unwanted visitors. Then in the 1970s, American researchers called the astronomy-related theory into question. They noted that in a region like Nazca, one of the driest places on Earth with only around 20 minutes of rain per year, water is a real treasure and the straight lines and trapezoids must have had something to do with it. They could be pointing at locations for rituals that the local people organized to obtain water and make crops more fertile. The images of animals in the Andes region are also related to water. Spiders are thought to be a sign of rain. Hummingbirds stand for fertility. And monkeys living in the Amazon symbolize an abundance of water. In more recent years, the Nazca lines have become the research ground for archaeologists from Yamagata University. They're using high-resolution aerial photography and drones to discover and catalog geoglyphs. The team has identified a total of 358 geoglyphs so far, and 168 out of them in 2022 alone. They found images of humans, camelids, birds, orca whales, cats, and snakes most likely created between 100 BCE and 300 CE. Some of the images are around 10 to 20 feet long, so it's no wonder no one was able to detect them before. The largest geoglyphs, by comparison, are 1,200 feet across, which is about the height of the Empire State Building. The researchers believe the Nazca lines were used as a form of communication in the desert. 
The linear ones pointed the direction from valley to valley. The ones drawn on slopes seem to have been drawn along ancient pathways between settlements. The scientists now plan to find patterns in the geoglyphs depending on their distribution. They use artificial intelligence to analyze the images. The AI generates designs that are likely to be painted in the desert, and the team then checks if they're actually among the Nazca lines. Another famous Peruvian geoglyph is a candelabra, slightly taller than the Washington Monument. You can find it on a seaside hill in the Paracas Peninsula. Researchers managed to establish the approximate age of the candelabra by analyzing the nearby artifacts. It looks like it dates back to around 200 BCE. The drawing is etched deep into the sand, and it was never mm. meant to look like a candelabra. One theory says that the drawing was supposed to resemble the trident of an Incan deity to please it. Another popular theory is that sailors used it as a beacon for navigation. Effigy Mounds National Monument on the Mississippi River has 195 known Native American mounds. Most of them are conical in shape, and there are also several that look like birds, deer, turtles, bears, and panthers. Scientists have established that the mounds date back to around 450 BCE, and the images are somewhat younger. A study of the mounds found some copper, bone, and stone tools. The builders' descendants say that the mounds served as ceremonial sites. This story is passed down from generation to generation. Some historians believe the mounds could have been also used to mark celestial events or territories. The American Southwest and the nearby regions of Mexico have over 300 intaglios, which are giant images engraved in the ground. The most famous of them are the Blythe intaglios in California, west of the Colorado River. Blythe giants are a group of six figures, including that of a human being and an animal. Scientists believe the images are somewhere between 450 and 2,000 years old. According to the local Mojave tribe, there is an image of Mustamho, the creator of life. The animal figure shows a mountain lion who served as his helper. The largest figure is almost as tall as the Leaning Tower of Pisa. The creators of the intaglios had to scrape the dark rock of the desert until the lighter soil showed up. It's nearly impossible to notice them from ground level. That's why they were only discovered in the 1930s, when a pilot flying over them accidentally looked down. The best way to see the giants is still from a helicopter. Kazakhstan can boast its own Nazca lines, a cluster of around 260 earthworks in the north of the country. The steppe geoglyphs are a variety of geometric shapes, including squares, crosses, circles, and a three-pronged design. The creators of the images used materials such as dirt, rocks, and lumber to build them out of the ground. A local economist first spotted the geoglyphs while browsing Google Earth in 2007. Archaeologists suppose that the structures go back 8,000 years, but they still don't know who built them or why. One theory says that the lines helped track the sun's movement. NASA got interested in the discovery since the lines are much older than the ones in Peru. They took photos of the steppe geoglyphs from space, trying to solve their mystery. Another fact that makes the lines so special is how huge they are. One of the largest of them has sides as long as an aircraft carrier. The only humans who could have built them must have been the nomadic Stone Age tribes. But it's unlikely that they had such advanced tools. If they did, that would mean that archaeologists need to rethink the abilities of our long-ago ancestors. Organizing such a huge amount of people to work together on a complicated project is an amazing feat. Although the white horse on a lush green hill in Oxfordshire, England could easily pass for modern art, it's actually one of the most ancient geoglyphs. It was created between the Bronze and Iron Ages and is the oldest chalk-cut hill figure in Britain. Whoever created it had to remove the turf to reveal the chalky white part of the soil. Scientists can only guess why this piece of art was created. It could have been a fertility symbol or a way to mark territory. Aerial images prove that the horse has changed over time because of the soil. 
it took several centuries to reveal a larger horse-like shape that lies under what we see now. These days, we discover exoplanets that are thousands of light years away. We descend to the ocean's depths and conquer the highest peaks. We study quantum physics and build quantum computers. But for some reason, we still don't know about these strange lights in the night sky. Some of them are still unexplained. Some may turn into unexpected discoveries, and others are large-scale falsifications. Let's start with the most mysterious burning balls. These lights regularly appear near the town of Marfa in West Texas. These basketball-sized lights suddenly appear out of nowhere in the middle of the night. They flicker, split into two parts, and take off into the sky several times a year. For several generations, people have seen blue, white, yellow, and other lights. The existence of these lights is not some legend, but a fact confirmed by scientists, but they still need to explain its nature. A local shepherd first noticed Marfa lights in 1883. At first, he thought that those were the fires that Apaches had made. Neighbors told the shepherd that they had seen the mysterious lights too. They all decided to check the Apache theory, and it turned out to be wrong. There were no traces of a fire in the place the lights had been flying above. Then, in the 40s, pilots of the nearest Midland airfield saw the Marfa lights. They also wanted to figure out the secret of this phenomenon, but didn't find out anything. More and more people saw the bizarre lights. Many of them were sure that the lights had been some ships of an extraterrestrial civilization. Others said those were the souls of wandering spirits. But scientific theories seemed much more realistic. A group of physics students conducted their own investigation and found out that the lights were the headlights of cars passing on the nearest highway. Okay, some lights do look like headlights, but what about those that take off into the sky and change their colors? It may be an optical illusion that occurs when a layer of cold air presses on a warm one. You can observe the same visual effect in the ocean when it seems to you that a ship is floating in the air on the horizon. But if these lights are headlights and an optical illusion, why do people see them only a few times a year? Another version of the light's origin suggests that there are something like swamp lights. You can see mysterious bright balls rising into the sky in the middle of the night. Organic substances such as twigs, leaves, and fallen trees decompose in wet areas and emit phosphine and methane gases. When these substances come into contact with oxygen, they ignite, but there are no such wet places in West Texas. Where could this gas come from? There are a lot of oil and natural gas reserves in the bowels of this region, and all these substances can contain phosphine and methane. It sounds realistic, but scientists have not confirmed this version yet. Aerospace engineer James Bunnell explained the nature of Marfa lights by an unusual electric charge. Solid substances such as minerals and various crystals generate electricity under pressure and this underground energy bursts out in the form of multicolored lights. But the scientist couldn't prove his theory. Marfa lights are still a mystery. Perhaps you can solve it. Other lights surprise people in Norway in the city of Hesdalen. Hesdalen lights, unlike other similar phenomena, can often appear in the night sky. And of course, people have recorded them on camera many times. From 1981 to 1984, Hesdalen lights appeared 10 to 20 times a week. Now, people observe them from 10 to 20 times a year. These giant balls float in the air, pulsate, flash, and move very fast. Also, the balls can hang in the air from a few seconds to several hours. Even though people recorded them on camera many times, scientists still cannot study them. Hestalin lights are very bright, and if people understand their nature, they can create light sources using this unknown alternative energy. So far, there are several theories about these lights. Physicists suggest that the balls appear when clouds of dust containing scandium burn in the air. It's a light silver-colored metal. There are many deposits of this substance in the valley where people observe Hestalin lights. 
Another theory says that the balls are the result of the accumulation of macroscopic crystals in the dust plasma. This plasma is formed when air is ionized and blah blah blah. In short, this is a complex scientific hypothesis that hasn't been confirmed. Scientists need a lot of funding to study Hestalen lights. Researchers try to attract investors by saying that the mechanism of Hestalen lights can encourage a technological leap in light-based technologies. Some of the most famous lights in the world appeared in Phoenix, Arizona in 1997. Tens of thousands of people saw two strange phenomena that day. The first was a giant flying triangle. At about 8 p.m., several lights appeared in the sky, lined up in a triangle. They flew in an even formation through Phoenix and disappeared far into the sky. The second phenomenon started about two hours later. People noticed lights hovering in the sky. They didn't form a triangle and moved freely. They burned with a bright light, flew in different directions, and disappeared behind a mountain range southwest of Phoenix. People were scared. They called the police and reported strange lights. Many were sure that those were ships of an extraterrestrial civilization. But the explanation soon appeared. Both incidents were the result of aircraft exercises. In the first case, people saw several planes lined up in a triangle. They flew over Phoenix and landed at an air base nearby. In the second case, exercises were held using lighting rockets. Several planes dropped glowing rockets, which were landing on tiny parachutes for a long time. They burned in the air and then disappeared behind a mountain range. Quite a logical explanation, but then, almost 10 years later, something strange happened again. On April 21, 2008, the Phoenix police station received hundreds of messages from worried residents who had seen strange lights in the sky. Four bright balls hovered over the city, changing their shape. They became triangular, then rectangular, and then disappeared one by one. The police contacted the nearest airfield, but they said that the radar hadn't seen any objects in the sky. If those had been material things, the radar devices would have shown them. The police had no explanation. The air traffic controllers also didn't know what it was. The case caused a great stir in society. Many began to recall the phenomenon that occurred a decade ago and again claimed that those were extraterrestrial ships. But all disputes ended after two days. Some man called local television and admitted that he had created the lights using flares and helium balloons. He tied a flare to a balloon set it on fire, and lifted it into the air. Then, minutes later, he repeated this action. Then again, four times. Many witnesses of the lights didn't believe this story and continued to insist on the extraterrestrial nature of the mysterious balls. But they were wrong. Radars would have noticed something if objects with a metal surface had been flying there, but light balloons and flares were too small to be detected by radars. Secondly, all the lights were flying to the east. The wind was blowing in the same direction that day. Third, the time of the burning. Signal rockets burned for about 20 minutes. When one of those lights faded, the second burned down for another minute. And the last one went out about 20 to 30 minutes after the first fire was started. Witnesses mentioned the same duration of time. One of the locals was a neighbor of the guy who confessed to organizing the hoax. The neighbor saw him lighting flares around 8 p.m. at about the time when the calls to the police started. Phoenix lights have become a great example of how easy it is to deceive people and cause a stir. In the heart of the galaxy, there lies a mysterious object, the likes of which no astronomer has ever seen. It streaks across the sky like a shooting star on caffeine. So what is this mysterious blob? And how is it related to the black hole in the center of our galaxy? Let's find out. This thing is called X7. It's the mysterious blob that's been hanging around our galaxy's supermassive black hole for decades. Some even say it's been lurking around there for, like, hundreds of years. We know a few things about X7. For example, it weighs around 50 times as much as Earth. It may sound like a lot if you're an Earthling, but in space, that's like a tiny drop in the ocean. 
X7 is also moving pretty fast, at speeds of up to 700 miles per second. That's faster than you trying to catch the last slice of pizza before your roommate gets to it. But what in the world is this thing? A magic star we've never seen before? An extraterrestrial spaceship? Well, there are some theories connected to the blob's future tragic fate. Unfortunately, X7's days are numbered. Right now, it's on a 170-year-long elliptical orbit around the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. But it's not going to make it that far. Each year, it's spiraling closer and closer to the black hole. In just a few years, it will become spaghettified. Yes, that's a real scientific term. And finally get sucked in, never to be seen again. There are supermassive black holes in the centers of all galaxies, including our very own Milky Way. These black holes are so massive that they warp space-time, causing nearby stars to orbit around them at incredible speeds. They serve as cosmic vacuum cleaners that suck in anything and everything that comes close enough. The black hole in our galaxy is called the Sagittarius A star. Sounds like the name of a fancy Hollywood celebrity, doesn't it? But this celestial object is far more impressive than any mere mortal. It's about 4 million times more massive than our sun, which means it could probably eat our entire solar system for breakfast. But don't worry, these black holes may seem really scary, but in reality, they're too small to compete with an entire galaxy. They'll just suck in a couple of the nearest stars, and that's all. Also, Sagittarius A star doesn't seem to have a very good appetite. It's been observed to be pretty quiet lately, which is good news for us. But even if it were super greedy, it wouldn't pose any threat to us. This black hole is over 26,000 light years away. From Earth, we can see it in the Sagittarius constellation. In 2022, the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration released the first ever image of Sagittarius A star. It took years of collaboration and technology to capture this stunning image. And this is our second photo of a black hole in history. The first one was released in 2019, and it showed the supermassive black hole called M87 star. Yes, they both have star in their names. Don't try to make it make sense. Anyway, you may remember this photo as the first ever image of a black hole ever. It went crazy viral across the internet. And this black hole, M87 star, located in the Messier 87 galaxy, is way scarier than Sagittarius A star. You thought 4 million solar masses is impressive? Then how about 2.5 billion solar masses? M87 is a real monster. It's also known for its powerful jets of plasma, which are so energetic that they extend thousands of light years from the black hole's center. If M87 were a superhero, it would be Iron Man with his repulsor beams on full blast. Now, technically, you can't take a photo of a black hole itself since it's, well, black. No light can escape its grasp. But the glowing orange ring in this photo shows the matter surrounding Sagittarius A star. It's called the accretion disk, a swirling disk of hot gas that spirals the center, heating up to millions of degrees in the process. It's like a giant fiery vortex, but with no escape. And the shadow in the center indicates the black hole itself. Inside that shadow, there's an event horizon the event horizon is the boundary around the black hole, beyond which nothing, not even light, can escape its gravitational pull. It's the point of no return, where the gravitational force is so strong that even the fastest object in the universe, light, can't escape. Once you cross the event horizon, you're doomed to fall toward the center of the black hole, where the laws of physics as we know them break down. And this is exactly the fate that awaits our unfortunate X7. Right now, the pure blob is getting stretched and yanked by powerful tidal forces. By the way, before it meets its untimely demise, X7 is expected to put on a bit of a show. Its closest approach to the black hole, called periastron, 
is projected to happen in 2036. And when it finally gets torn apart by the Sagittarius A-star's gravitational forces, there may be some cool fireworks to see. But this is not the most important thing. The funny part is, X7's future end may help us finally understand what the heck even is this thing? A team of scientists have been studying how a strange blob orbits the black hole. And that's when they discovered that X7 has stretched to almost twice its initial length. And what does that mean? Well, it suggests that X7 is most likely made of debris ejected during a recent collision between two stars. Yep, you heard that right, a space car crash. Imagine this, two stars fall in love and start circling each other for many years. After that, they finally merge together. At this moment, they eject tons of gas and dust. And perhaps this cosmic dance created our blob baby, X7. It's basically like the crumbs left on the table after a giant space beast. Something like this is actually pretty common, especially around black holes. It's like a galactic fender bender that sends debris flying everywhere. Actually, the universe is full of mystery blobs. They're called the G-objects. No, they're not the G-men from Men in Black, but they're just as mysterious and elusive. These guys have been puzzling astronomers for more than 20 years. They look like gas clouds, but behave like stars. It's like they can't decide whether they want to be a cloud or a star. Come on, guys, make up your mind. G objects stretch out at the closest point to the central black hole, but emerge intact, like a rubber band that stretches but doesn't break. Scientists think that they're the stars that have merged together into one. And while doing that, they also produce a huge cloud of gas that hides the result from view. Kind of like when you're wearing a bulky sweater so that no one knows that you've put on a few extra pounds. And then a study published in 2021 found that one of these objects, G2, was actually a molecular cloud concealing three baby stars. Huh, talk about a plot twist. But X7 is the black sheep of the strange blob family. It's significantly different from the G objects, like the weird cousin you see once a year at family gatherings. Its evolution has been more dramatic. Also, it's not being held together by a mass lurking in its center. So what is it being held together by? Pixie dust? Magic? We need answers! That's why scientists believe that X7 isn't a G object itself but debris left from it. Or maybe not. We have no idea. The possibilities are endless, and that's what makes astronomy so exciting. So let's keep our eyes on the skies and see what other strange objects are out there. Who knows, maybe we'll discover another mystery blob, and this time it's going to be a spaceship. Now that would be awesome. If you've ever been to Yellowstone National Park, you were probably mesmerized by its geysers, which spew superheated water and steam high into the air. But an even more intriguing thing actually hides underground. I'm talking about that underfoot plumbing system that makes those grand eruptions possible. About that, there's good news. Recently, researchers have succeeded in mapping the National Park's hydrothermal plumbing system with the help of a giant flying magnet. As a result, scientists have managed to document all these features in stunning detail. The thing is, Yellowstone houses the world's largest hydrothermal system. It contains over 10,000 features, like geysers, mud pots, hot springs, and steam vents. They're fed by a network of underground water pathways. Those get overheated by magma flowing underground. It causes the water to rise to the surface. Now, no one actually knows much about the workings of this system but the newly created maps might finally shed light on it. Experts explain that their knowledge of Yellowstone has a subsurface gap. That's why it's often called a mystery sandwich. Scientists know quite a lot about the features on the surface because they can observe them directly. And they know what's going on in the magmatic and tectonic system several miles below the surface. But they haven't figured out what's happening in the middle yet. So, I must tell you about that giant flying magnet used for research. It's known as SkyTem. 
It was attached to a helicopter and flown over Yellowstone several hundred times, scanning the ground below. The magnet is made up of an 82-foot-wide charged wire loop. Its main task is to generate a strong electromagnetic field. And since different kinds of material, like water or rock, respond to this field differently, scientists managed to create a few subsurface maps for the first time ever. The mapping technique also allowed the researchers to differentiate between magma and bedrock, since they have a bit different magnetic properties. And the team got a chance to see how the magma and water interact and create those mind-blowing geological features on the surface. The team got high-resolution maps to a depth of around 500 and 2300 feet, and low-resolution maps showing what's going on at a depth of up to 1.5 miles. At the same time, the researchers think that the hydrothermal system itself may stretch as far as 3 miles below the surface. If they're right, it means they've only mapped the top half of Yellowstone's plumbing system. Anyway, remember how I said that scientists know pretty much about the bottom part of the Yellowstone sandwich? They have such a good idea about the tectonic plates and deep fault lines because the park's frequent earthquakes provide them with a lot of opportunities to study different phenomena. In July 2021, for example, more than 1,000 earthquakes rocked the area. These days, the team of researchers knows much more about some famous features, like the Old Faithful Geyser or the Grand Prismatic Spring. They've also found out that individual hydrothermal features on the surface can actually be connected to others, which can be as far as 6 miles away from them. Another interesting discovery is that even though Yellowstone geysers and hot springs vary in size, shape, color, volatility, and chemical composition, they are mostly fed by very similar underground sources. That means that the difference between the features appears closer to the surface. Now, I'm sure you've seen the iconic image of Yellowstone with a large rainbow-colored spring, fiery orange at its edges. So what makes these hot springs so colorful? Surprisingly, these awesome hues come from microscopic creatures. The temperatures in the springs are so high, they can easily and quickly cook you. Plus, the water there is super acidic, like the liquid in a car battery. But there are certain types of heat-loving microbes that don't mind these crazy conditions. You can even say they're thriving there. So every ring of a different color is, in most cases, a ring inhabited by different bacteria. And each species is adapted to a particular temperature or pH level, which measures how acidic this or that environment is. For example, take the Grand Prismatic Spring, yes, the iconic one. Its rainbow hues likely hint at the diversity of microbes living there. So, starting from the center of the hot spring, you can see a beautiful aquamarine color there. That's where the water temperature is the highest, reaching 189 degrees Fahrenheit, because this area is right over the underground water source. The water there is too hot even for microbes. That's why what you see is mostly clear water. As for the reason for its blue color, it's the same as why the sky is blue. Sunlight hits the surface of the water, and the light scatters. But the blue light scatters the most, getting reflected back to your eyes. Now, the next ring of color is yellow, all thanks to certain cyanobacteria. The temperature in this yellow ring reaches 165 degrees Fahrenheit. If the conditions in the hot spring were a bit different, these bacteria would create a blue-green hue thanks to a green pigment called chlorophyll. But since the sunlight hitting the spring is too intense, the bacteria start producing another type of pigment. It's called carotenoids. And guess what? It acts as a sunscreen for the bacteria. And since this pigment is orange, the normally green bacteria get a yellowish hue. And finally, we've got that bright orange color closer to the edges of the prismatic spring. It's a bit cooler there, around 149 degrees Fahrenheit. In this part of the spring, you can find several types of bacteria. They all produce substances that give the spring this bright orange color. And finally, right at the edges of the spring, the temperature is cooler, around 131 degrees, and a greater variety of microbes can survive there. All of them combined give the edges of the spring that red-brown hue. But scientists believe that people and their activity may have influenced the colors of Yellowstone's hydrothermal features. For example, in the past, the temperatures in the morning glory pool used to be much higher than they are today. 
That's why its color was a deep blue. But trash has started to accumulate in the pool, and some of it clogged the vent. This caused the temperatures to drop, which led to microbial growth. As a result, that pretty blue color turned into orange-yellow. As for Yellowstone's geysers, the most famous one is called Old Faithful. It got this name at the end of the 19th century because of how regular its eruptions were. This geyser is more active than the others, erupting about 20 times a day. Each of these magnificent events lasts from 1 to 5 minutes. And the fountain of steaming water can reach a height of 180 feet. Now, while talking about Yellowstone National Park, we can't but mention Yellowstone Supervolcano, right? Supervolcanoes appear when huge volumes of magma are trying to escape from deep underground. Eventually, they burst through Earth's surface. Sometimes, all this magma gets stuck, unable to break through the planet's crust. And then, massive pools of pressurized magma gather at a depth of several miles. The pressure keeps growing because more and more magma is trying to get to the surface. At one point, a super eruption goes off. You don't necessarily want to be around for that. Over the past 50 years, the Yellowstone caldera has risen almost 3 feet. It shouldn't alarm you, though. Experts are sure it's a natural behavior for Yellowstone. Periods of dome-shaped uplift are followed by the caldera lowering. Scientists think the supervolcano doesn't present any danger at the moment. For an eruption to happen, the magma inside has to be at least 50% molten. With Yellowstone, this number is just 5-15%. to Even better, a recent study made the researchers believe the hot spot might be in a state of decline right now, even despite all the breathing and dome-raising activity. There have been at least three other super eruptions in the history of Yellowstone Volcano. They happened 2.1 million, 1.3 million, and 640,000 years ago, long before video. The most recent super eruption was dubbed the Lava Creek Eruption. It formed the Yellowstone Caldera after spilling out 240 cubic miles of rock, dust, and volcanic ash. No thanks, I'll pass. Hey, I have an invitation for you. Pack your bags and let's head down to the world's most visited city, Paris. The city of love, the city of blinding lights, or whatever you want to call it. Our goal is to uncover as many secrets as possible regarding the world-famous Musée de Louvre. Are you up for it? Grab your travel book and bon voyage! The Louvre makes a big impression if you're visiting it for the first time. The traditional French Renaissance architecture is mixed with some modern elements, like the Louvre Pyramid. And that's our first stop today. To get inside the museum, you can go through the huge glass pyramid sitting right there in the Louvre's courtyard. If you're wondering what's the deal with this pyramid, let's stop here for a few minutes and learn some more about it. The Louvre Pyramid hasn't been here since the beginning. After all, the Louvre's main building, aka the Louvre Palace, dates back to 1190. But before it looked like what you see today, this place was a castle, full of moats and dungeons, and not dragons, because those aren't real, unfortunately. Anyways, the palace was commissioned by French King Philip II. Oh, and you can check out some of the medieval Louvre in the museum's basement. The Louvre only became a museum quite recently, historically speaking. In 1793, after the French Revolution, the nation decided that this building would be used to display France's prized collection of art. It wasn't until the 1980s that the idea of the glass pyramid came along. Then President Francois Mitterrand issued a big renovation of the Louvre. The project was called Grand Louvre, and it included the construction of a new entrance for visitors. By the 80s, the museum had already been receiving millions of visitors per year, and the entrance would often get crowded. And that's when foreign architect Ayo Ming Pei comes along. Mitterrand hired Pei to build an entrance that would connect the museum's three pavilions. And if you ask me, I'd say he did a pretty good job. We're talking about 200 tons of glass and iron. Not to mention that this glass, the so-called diamond glass, was specially designed to be completely transparent, without any green or blue tint to it. Pei wanted visitors to have a clear view of the main buildings without the glass interfering with it. 
It took two years just to get the glass color right. It also took a while before Pei decided he was going to build a pyramid. He experimented with designing a cube and even a hemisphere. But since the original building doesn't have any curves, this would make the courtyard piece too out of context. So he decided to build a pyramid instead, inspired by the ones in Egypt. After all, the Louvre holds an immense collection of ancient Egyptian artifacts. So that kind of makes sense. Just a wild guess here. The thing is, the French are pretty critical. And once the Louvre pyramid was finished in 1988, it became the center of a very heated debate. Public opinion was unsettled by such a modern construction. Today, people take all kinds of weird selfies with the pyramid. But back then, locals were saying that the modern architecture had nothing to do with the Louvre's Renaissance style or even the history of the building. Some even said that the pyramid wasn't French enough. Yikes! <laughs> Standing in line to get inside the Louvre, you can't help but wonder, how do people clean this huge glass pyramid? We're talking glass slopes, so this sure isn't an easy feat. In the beginning, the museum administration apparently hired mountaineers to climb it and clean it. And some still do this job nowadays when the robot built for this task can't clean all the dirty spots off the glass. I'm not joking, the Louvre pyramid is cleaned by a robot. You know what they say, the future is here. Once you're down the escalators, you'll notice that this awesome pyramid you were taking pictures with upstairs has an inverted face to it downstairs. It serves as a skylight to the Carousel de Louvre, which is like an underground shopping mall or the museum's main lobby. Hey, look, there's an Apple store, except that the French people pronounce it iPad. You'll have the option to choose from three different wings of the museum, the Richelieu, Soli, or Denon. I say we begin with Denon. You'll understand why in a bit. Did you know that the Louvre exhibits around 35,000 pieces of art? That's why it's virtually impossible to visit everything in one day. If you're an art lover, you'll have to come back here for more visits. But to see all the pieces of art spending around 30 seconds on each, you'd have to visit the Louvre over 100 times. And that's not counting restroom and lunch breaks. You get the picture, right? The museum is huge. That's why it takes about a 10-minute walk to get from the lobby entrance to the Louvre's most famous painting, the Mona Lisa. But since you're here early, you managed to take good pictures of this Da Vinci masterpiece. A little known fact, the Mona Lisa was once stolen from the Louvre. It was once stolen at night by a man called Vincenzo Perugia. He was an employee of the museum, and investigators think he slept inside the Louvre to perform what is known as the greatest art theft of the 20th century. Apparently, the next morning, Vincenzo simply walked out of the museum with the Mona Lisa hidden among his belongings. The Mona Lisa was gone for almost two years until the painting was recovered in Italy. Who knows, maybe she enjoyed the trip back to her homeland. If you're an art history buff, you might know that the Mona Lisa has lots of theories revolving around it. The painting is shrouded in mystery. That's a fact. A strong case has been made that the Mona Lisa could be a self-portrait of da Vinci himself. Historians have compared da Vinci's face and that of the Mona Lisa, and guess what? They appear to be strikingly similar. Also, a 2010 study done by Italy's Committee for Cultural Heritage found that there is a collection of symbols hidden in the painting. These are only visible through highly technological magnifying lenses, but they showed that Leonardo inscribed an LV inside Mona Lisa's right eye. Experts guess that this is da Vinci's signature, but the other symbols, a CE in the left eye and a 72 in the arch of the background bridge are still a mystery. But enough about La Gioconda, we want to get to the Soli wing of the museum. Along the way, you'll see some people sitting in front of paintings with a drawing book or even a canvas. Is that allowed? Yep, this is a very interesting feature of the Musée de Louvre. The museum houses an art school called École de Louvre. The students of this school, as well as other Parisian institutions, can get permits to sit in front of paintings and copy them. This way, promising young artists can learn directly from the source. They copy the works of Renoir, Monet, and Poussin, trying to figure out the techniques these painters used. 
Hmm, can I sign up for this, please? To finish your tour, you're visiting the ancient moat we talked about earlier in this video. You know, the one that was part of the original Louvre when it was still a castle. Thanks to the archaeological excavations that happened in the 1980s, this part was uncovered and has been open for visitation since 2016. You can even see a miniature model of what the original castle looked like. And if you visited other landmarks in Paris, you'll notice that it's pretty similar to the Conciergerie. I wonder if they've ever thought about producing cheese down here. It seems like the perfect place. Oh well, I hope you enjoyed learning some secrets of the world's most famous museum. See you next time! You might not think about gravity much, but it affects everything we do. It's the reason why things fall down instead of flying up. It keeps us connected to the Earth, so we don't float away into space when we jump. But for physicists, gravity is something more. It's a fascinating puzzle that needs to be solved to understand how the universe works, and they're on a quest to uncover its secrets. So what's so mysterious about it? Let's see. We've learned a lot about gravity from the legendary Isaac Newton. He was the first to invent the law of gravitation. He taught us that any two objects in the universe can't help but be attracted to each other. It's like they have this secret gravitational crush going on. How strong this attraction is depends on two things. How big the objects are, that is their mass, and how close they are to each other. But here's where it gets cool. Gravity isn't just a two-object dance. It's a complex space choreography. Take our solar system, for example. The sun plays the lead role, using its gravitational pull to keep all the planets in their orbits. But each planet also has its own gravitational mojo, tugging at the sun and even its neighboring planets. Then, a few hundred years later, another hero, Albert Einstein, took gravity to a whole new level. He described the theory of general relativity. According to Einstein, gravity isn't just a regular force. In reality, it's curving and warping the fabric of space-time. Think of it as a heavyweight champion sitting on a rubber sheet. The sheet bends and curves under the weight, and the smaller objects nearby can't help but roll towards the heavyweight. Now, even though we can't see space's curves with our own eyes, we can see what happens to objects that get caught in its grasp. Getting pulled by gravity is like being caught in a whirlwind of forces. The caught object starts spiraling downward, just like a coin in those penny slot cyclone machines you find at tourist shops. Or it might move gracefully in circles, like bicycles racing around a velodrome track. Gravity is the primordial force that guides our entire world. Without it, there would be no stars, no galaxies, nothing. But where does it come from? Well, that's the million dollar question. And we don't have a complete answer just yet. But we do have some guesses. First of all, we know that gravity is more than just a feature of space. It's a force that pulls things together. Surprisingly, it's the weakest force among them all. But let's take a different look at gravity. Something that may surprise you. Instead of being a force that directly pushes or pulls objects from a distance, it's more like a dance. Gravity, as amazing as it is, doesn't perform alone in this dance. It shares the spotlight with other forces, like electromagnetism, for example. Let's imagine two electrons. There are dancers. Now, they don't directly push or pull each other like you might expect. Instead, one electron creates a special kind of field around itself, like an invisible force field. This field sets the stage for the show. The other electron senses this field and starts to twirl and interact with it. It's like they're following some choreography. And when we watch this dance, it looks as if the second electron is being pushed or pulled by the first one. But in reality, it's all about the intricate movements and interplay between the dancers and the field they're dancing in. The dancers never touch each other directly, but their interactions through these fields make it seem like they're connected. It's a magical display of fields and movements coming together to create the illusion of forces at play. The thing we call gravity. So even though it's not a force in the usual way, it behaves like one. We call it an emergent force, because it emerges or comes out from the way space and objects interact. Which is why, if we want to get technical, some scientists prefer to avoid the words gravitational force and opt for the term interaction. It's just a way for particles to mingle and exchange energy and information. Electromagnetic interactions, gravitational interactions, they're all part of this grand soiree. At least that's one of the theories. Some scientists also think that gravity might be made up of tiny particles called gravitons. 
these sneaky particles work behind the scenes, making objects attract each other. However, we haven't been able to directly see these elusive gravitons yet. So, according to this theory, gravity is both a force and a potential particle. As you can see, we have some struggles with explaining how gravity works on a large scale. But at least we have a good understanding of how it behaves in certain situations, like how planets orbit the sun, or how objects fall to the ground and stuff. But what happens when we zoom into the atomic scale? And what if we venture into the depths of black holes and the Big Bang? Now here's where gravity's wild ride goes off the rails. First, let's enter the realm of quantum mechanics. There's something peculiar that happens in this tiny world. Gravity, the force that pulls things together, seems to take a back seat. On a microscopic scale, other forces like electromagnetism take the spotlight and become the superstars. They're overshadowing gravity, and this leaves scientists scratching their heads, wondering, is this possible? Why does gravity suddenly fade away? So far, we have no idea. And when it comes to the grandest scales, where immense objects like black holes, gravity takes on a whole new level of complexity. For example, inside a black hole, Laws of physics and gravity, as we know them, basically fall apart. It also decays when we try to understand how gravity behaved immediately after the Big Bang. Where did it even come from? We have no idea. In other words, we find ourselves in a cosmic fog when it comes to understanding gravity. But fear not. Scientists are working hard to learn more about this enigmatic emergent force. They're doing all sorts of experiments and using fancy technology to crack its code. Even though we still have a lot to figure out, we're making progress every day. For example, have you ever heard of gravitational lensing? It's like a mesmerizing magic trick. Imagine a beam of light as a fearless explorer, taking a straight path through the universe. But as it encounters the gravitational pull of a massive object, the light's journey becomes a wild roller coaster ride. The gravity of the massive object bends the fabric of space-time, creating a funhouse mirror effect. Our brave beam of light finds itself curving and twisting around the massive object, following a new unexpected path. But as the light changes its trajectory, it also reveals to us distant and hidden wonders that would have remained invisible otherwise. The light can magnify, distort, or even create multiple images of faraway objects. So all the things that have been playing hide-and-seek with us finally become visible, like black holes. There's also a mind-blowing idea called gravitational waves. Einstein predicted their existence tens of years ago, but only recently have we finally been able to confirm them. And that was a huge breakthrough in the science world. These waves carry the echoes of cataclysmic cosmic events, such as the collision of massive black holes or the birth of newborn stars. Just like dropping a pebble into a serene pond, these crazy events cause a ripple effect. But instead of water, it's space-time itself that ripples and warps. Scientists have just recently developed a way to listen to these whispers. They've created instruments capable of detecting these gravitational waves. These instruments, known as interferometers, are like ears that are finely tuned to catch the subtle vibrations of the universe. But one thing's for sure. Gravity is a superstar that shapes our universe. It keeps everything around us connected and rules our entire universe. The quest to unveil its ultimate secrets continues, and it's a thrilling adventure for scientists and curious minds alike. There are insects in nature that love to make a lot of noise. Imagine you're at a rock concert where a singer loudly yells into a microphone, and the guitarists give out deafening chords, and all this is transmitted through giant speakers. It feels like the music passes through your body. You will experience a similar sensation if you find yourself near a swarm of cicadas. These creatures create a clicking, ringing sound with the help of vibrating membranes on their stomachs. The awakening of cicadas is always a surprise for people. Any day you can wake up to a loud noise outside. Cicadas gather in huge swarms, fly out into the streets, and cover cars, trees, and buildings. They chatter for weeks, and then silence comes cicadas disappear as suddenly as they appear. The cicada's sounds can be pleasant or harmful to your ears depending on the species. It can be something melodic and captivating. When millions of cicadas click in the forest, it resembles the sound of a jet plane or a circular saw working. Some people can't stand it and run away from the singing swarm. 
but many also say that cicadas make a pleasant sound that envelops you from all sides, which is a pretty unusual feeling. They make this noise to attract breeding partners or to warn their families of danger. Perhaps they are just having fun. And the reason for such joy is their life cycle. Cicadas spend several years underground and then come out to make noise for the last several weeks of their lives. And what they do under the surface is one of the most exciting mysteries for scientists. So, cicadas are physically strong insects with big eyes and unique wings. We'll talk about their uniqueness later, but now let's figure out why these insects are so awesome. There are about 3,000 species of cicadas, but they are all divided into two groups, annual and periodic ones. Annual is a common type. You can meet them all over the world. They live from two to five years or longer and have a normal insect lifestyle. They fly, drink the sap of trees, and click. But periodic cicadas live only in North America, in the central and eastern regions of the USA. They can disappear as a species off the face of the earth and then, a few years later, appear in a forest and make such noise that you can hear it from afar. Imagine walking in the woods, picking mushrooms and berries, and then the soil begins to move and hundreds of thousands of cicadas are flying out. They are everywhere and they are very loud. But don't worry, they're not aggressive and won't bite you. The life cycle of these insects is divided into three parts, eggs, nymphs, and adults. At first, females lay several hundred eggs in different places. They leave their offspring near the ground on the branches of trees and brush. Then, after six to 10 weeks, little nymphs hatch out of them, fall to the floor, and burrow into the soil. There, they munch on fluids from the roots of plants and grow. They spend 13 or 17 years in these underground tunnels, then molt their shells and come out. And they all do it at the same time. It's as if someone gives them one order and they drop everything to come to the surface simultaneously. And after they rise, they start to click. Imagine spending more than 10 years in a cramped, dark space and then going out into a bright, open world where you will live for several weeks. No wonder cicadas are chirping so loudly, or they may have a great time underground and then decide to spend their retirement outdoors. Most likely, their appearance coincides with convenient natural conditions. They wait for the soil temperature to become comfortable for reproduction and come out. However, while the soil heats up and gets colder annually, cicadas come out once every 13 or 17 years. Scientists can't give an exact explanation for this, but it may be related to other animals. Cicadas are pretty defenseless and nutritious creatures. A swarm of millions of cicadas is a feast for many forest inhabitants. Owls and foxes like to eat them. Suppose the forest ecosystem gets used to the annual singing of cicadas. In that case, their enemies will quickly destroy the entire population of these insects. Therefore, cicadas come out when no one expects them. Perhaps they choose the moment when the population growth of owls and foxes is at the lowest level. To avoid meeting them, cicadas wait for several years. This version looks logical, but something doesn't work in it. If cicadas fight for survival in such a way, then why don't all species do it? Annual cicadas regularly appear in the forest and are an integral part of the ecosystem. They continue to exist despite the presence of many enemies. Why do periodic ones decide to hide? This is still unknown. A massive swarm of cicadas resembles locusts. So many consider them pests. But unlike these crop eaters, cicadas only feed on the sap of trees. They won't eat your corn, destroy your garden, and bite the leaves. Cicadas drink juice from branches and roots, and they do it quite rarely. Yes, a million cicadas can damage trees because of their relative weight, but the damage they cause to people is not comparable to what locusts do. Besides, 
cicadas will rarely bother you. You can finish university and change several jobs, and the cicadas would come out only once during this time, and they also look pretty cute for insects. Their wings have beautiful patterns, and their eyes are so huge. However, they can still terrify you, especially if you meet a swarm of cicadas on your way. Life underground seems safe, but even there, the cicadas have their antagonists. And the main one is a special kind of parasitic fungi that can penetrate the body of a cicada and slowly devour it. The fungus takes control of the body and turns the host into a living zombie. These parasites have also learned to change their life cycle following the life cycle of cicadas. That is, the fungus remains in the body of an insect for a long time and does nothing. And then, when the cicada comes to the surface, the parasite wakes up and begins to spoil its life. It feeds on the host's body and forces it to spread the fungus spores throughout the swarm to infect future generations. Another type of fungus doesn't wait for the cicadas to crawl to the surface. These parasites can cause infected insects to get out of the ground ahead of time, crawl up tree branches and scatter spores. Sometimes fungi grow out of cicadas while they are still underground. It seems that cicadas won't survive with such dangerous enemies, but nature has found a balance. Some types of fungi don't destroy their carriers. They live in symbiosis with cicadas. The parasite gets a home, and the cicada probably gets nutrients from the fungus. For scientists, this is a unique case when fungi abandon their parasitic lifestyle. With each emergence to the surface, the cicadas become bigger in size. This happens because large cities emit a lot of heat and nutrients into the air, warming the area by several degrees. This contributes to an increase in cicada's size, but the growth only applies to those insects that live near cities. Cicadas hiding in rural areas with colder temperatures retain the same size. The uniqueness of cicadas is not only in their life development, but also in their anatomy. When insects become adults, their wings get covered with tiny nanopillars that can repel water, destroy bacteria, and self-clean. Doctors, chemists, and engineers want to use the properties of cicada wings to develop new technologies in different fields. A coating with the cicada's nanopillars can help people create new medicines. Engineers want to use self-cleaning surfaces of the wings without glare as coatings for solar panels and other high-tech developments. So, yeah, cicadas actually help us a lot. You plan to spend your summer vacation in Africa. The final destination is the Sahara Desert. It's located in northern Africa, stretching from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea. You're excited to ride camels and learn about the region's rich cultures. You hop on an extensively long flight, and finally, you are here. You find yourself in the world's biggest hot desert. Can you believe it's 3 million square miles? You're ready for your first adventure after drinking liters of ice-cold water. The guide gives you a choice. You can spend two weeks visiting a collection of oases, or you can help them solve an ongoing local mystery. Deep into the desert, near this Algerian town, lies a mystery begging to be solved. A collection of huge, spotted circles in the sand. There are dozens of them, stretching for miles in a straight line. The circles were first identified via Google Earth images several years ago. People have debated them for years, but no one seems to know the answer. The strange thing is that they are so many miles away from any towns, roads, or human activity. The quickest way to discover the truth behind the circles is asking questions. You grab your notebook and set out to talk to locals. Everyone is helpful in this scenario – geographers, anthropologists, elders, and historians. The first person you talk to is a map expert. You need to understand if those circles were authentic or a satellite glitch. You end up interviewing the people who take Google Earth satellite pictures. The circles are really there. They appear in multiple pictures from many years. Then, let's understand why they are there in the first place. After two days of interviews, you have your first lead. 
The circles could be the result of oil activity. Experts explain why this would make sense. Algeria is a rich area for natural resources, so this would be a sensible guess. Usually, to find out if there is anything worth extracting, companies would undertake seismic surveys. Seismic surveys are a way of analyzing the Earth's surface by sending shock waves into the ground. Depending on how these waves bounce back, you'll know what is located there. A special vehicle could have marked the soil that way. So, did we unravel the mystery? Mm, Not quite so. As you know, the Sahara Desert is one of the driest areas on the planet. The average high temperatures in summer are over 104 degrees Fahrenheit. To survive there, people need to find ways of accessing water. So, these circles could be a kind of ruin or leftovers from ancient water wells. Again, I'd say this is a sensible guess. Ready for some fact-checking? Some anthropologists agree that these circles could be ancient fogueras. Fogera is the name of a 2,500-year-old style of irrigation system, usually found in northern Africa. It is also known as a kanat in other places in northern Africa. Locals would dig a deep well at an elevated point, deep enough to tap into underground water. They would then dig parallel shafts at regular distances. Then, they would dig an underground channel that connected the city to the well. Solely with the help of gravity, water would run from the well to the city. This traditional technology provided water for crops, livestock, and humans. Now, let's say these wells made human-made oases possible. Even the closest municipality name was an indication that this could be true. The name Fogaret Esaoia is actually named after Fogarets, these ancient wells. Now, this lead was proving to be very accurate. You decide to travel over there to see for yourself. You take a local bus, sit back, and enjoy the ride. The landscape in northern Algeria is filled with ancient-looking towns. You even see ruins of wells along the way, on the outskirts of smaller cities. Opening Google satellite images, you can see the Kanat's markings on the ground, a series of holes running down several miles. But as soon as you arrive, you find out you were wrong. Dale Lightfoot, one of the world's leading experts on Kanats, said that the circles were definitely not Kanats. Even the satellite images confirm this difference. Uh Uh-oh, we were so close! Apparently, Kanats or Fagras would not run down a straight line. They wouldn't be shaped like circles. Another clue that this wasn't the case was that there were no towns at the end. The circles were really far away from any human activity, and canots were explicitly built to provide water for human settlements. Well, it sure was a good try. You almost gave up on this mystery when you decided to take one more field trip. It was days of preparation, pick up cars, food, equipment, all so that the mystery of the Sahara circles could be unraveled. On the first day, you drove over 99 miles into the desert. You were always curious to see what this part of the world looked like. Over there, you see nothing but mustard yellow dunes. The night sky is pretty decent, though. You can see the entire Milky Way with your own eyes. You set up camp and sleep under a canopy of stars. The next day, tension grows. There's no cell reception. Oh dear. But thankfully, you added the coordinates of the circles to your Google map. And surprise, the offline mode works out there. You follow the coordinates, but it leads you astray. You start to get nervous, thinking this was all in vain. But you and the team get into the car and drive a few more miles past the coordinates on your phone. After a very bumpy ride, you can't believe your eyes. There it is, an enormous crater dug on the sand, surrounded by 12 smaller holes. From up high, it looks like a clock. Without the pointers, of course. On the ground, they're very faint. So faint, you almost missed them. Searching the area, you notice all the holes had something similar. Metal wires. Thin wires that you can pull from the ground. They're buried deep, so you start digging. An object starts to reveal itself. Uh Uh-oh! It looks like old dynamite. This certainly surprises you. Um, better stop digging to avoid any accidents. At the end of the survey, you feel satisfied, but still curious. What could all this dynamite mean? And who put it there? What comes next is the turning point of your adventure. 
Walking back to the car, you see something shining on the ground. You approach the item with curiosity. It's round and rusty and looks like a sardine can. What's that doing here? Could this give you more clues about the circle's mystery? Just in case, you pick it up and put it in the car. Back in the city, the puzzle pieces start to reveal the story behind the Sahara circles. You bring photos and the sardine can and show them to local experts. They analyze your material and give you an intriguing verdict. As it turns out, guess number one was the closest one to the truth. So, what happened to the first guess? Why do we need to keep digging deeper? Well, because it was only half right. The Sahara circles are not a historical footprint of seismic surveying. Back when the circles were made, this technology didn't even exist. But they sure are related to oil exploration. The dynamite-filled holes were an old method for oil searching. The circles are the leftovers of surveyors looking for resources underground. And the sardine cans? Well, they were left by the workers who held explosion works. You gotta eat, right? According to the model of the can, this happened more or less around the 1950s and 1960s. So these circles aren't even that ancient. More like modern ones, if you ask me. Well, well, well. Hope you are glad you tagged along and helped unravel this mystery. See you in the next mystery-solving adventure. You know, there are many doors all around the world that have no keys. Maybe you can guess how to open them. The first destination is... Okay, read this, and good luck to you. It's a temple in India. The temple's name comes from this other really long word, which can be translated as the one emerging from the lotus. This temple is one of India's most popular and sacred places. It's one of 108 temples of this word. It dates way back. It was mentioned in Tamil literature in the 6th century. Flash forward to our time. In 2011, the Indian Supreme Court decided to document the valuables of the temple because they had been informed that the place might have been misused. To do so, they had to open the doors that had been closed for centuries. The committee went to the temple and discovered six huge secret vaults that held unbelievable treasures. After the chamber doors opened, they found at least $22 billion worth of golden idols, necklaces, and coins. The officials also discovered ceremonial costumes and gold coconut shells with jewels. Plus, they saw large diamonds. Not our understanding of large, though. Some of these precious stones were as large as 110 carats. To put it in perspective, a small solid gold statue from the collection could be worth around $30 million. After this fairy tale-ish treasure had been discovered, the temple got equipped with metal detectors, cameras, and other safety precautions before the first visitors started to arrive. Now, there are a lot of security guards at the temple. But are they protecting the treasure, or is there something more mysterious hiding behind its doors? The temple has six chambers, and the valuables are kept there. These rooms are named Chambers A through F. The expedition committee opened five of these vaults with significant effort. But the most bizarre thing is that, despite all the efforts involving existing tech, the mysterious Chamber B still wouldn't open. On the side of the door, two carved cobras are welcoming you. The door works as a gate. You can easily see it with the unaided eye, just like the doors leading to other chambers. Surprise! Experts discover two more doors behind the first one. The second door is wooden, and the last one is made of iron. Strangely, the last door was sealed. It also doesn't have any means of entry, no bolts, handles, latches, or anything else. To this day, no one knows what's inside Chamber B. Believers say that opening the door against its will can release into the world unnameable things. Others say that Chamber B may hide a tunnel. It might not be related to the reasons above, but the High Court of India warned against opening the doors of Chamber B. Now, in 2010, David Crespi, a French engineer, visited Machu Picchu. He discovered a strange door in one of the main buildings. The door was in a narrow path neither tourists nor archaeologists used very often. David believed that the place was an entrance the Incas had sealed for some reason. He contacted archaeologists and authorities right away. 
they promised him to start investigating the area in the near future and let him know about his potential discovery. Well, months passed, but he didn't get any news. No response to his emails and calls. In 2011, he found an article by Terry Jameen about Peru. David reached out to him in no time. He described his finding to Jameen. After that, Jameen and other archaeologists went to Machu Picchu to investigate the secret door. They concluded that this door was indeed an entrance sealed by the Incas. The researchers confirmed the existence of two entrances found behind the famous door. They also got the 3D representation of a staircase leading to the main room and another chamber. The analysis also revealed several cavities, among which there was a vast quadrangular room. Plus, geo-radars detected some metals. Those might be golden and silver objects. Jameen and his team thought this place was a chamber of pre-Hispanic times. They believed the door had been sealed by the Incas to hide something important. Maybe an enormous treasure, or something no less precious. Jameen also claimed that finding this chamber could lead to the discovery of a mausoleum. Jameen submitted an official request to the Peruvian authorities for permission to open the chambers. Yet, neither his application nor requests of other archaeologists have been approved so far. Authorities claim that opening this door could cause damage on the other sides of the archaeological site. Yet, the use of an endoscopic camera has confirmed the hypothesis that the stone blocks at the entrance are only there to close the passage. They are not there to support the internal structures of the building. The third mystery is in Giza, Egypt. Explorers uncovered two secret doors inside the Great Pyramid. There are two tunnels, each around 8 inches wide, that go from the north and south walls of the Queen's Chamber. But the tunnels are closed by stone blocks before they reach the outside of the pyramid. So, where are they leading to? No one really knows the true purpose of these tunnels. Some archaeologists think these doors might be hiding a yet undiscovered chamber. Egyptologist Zahi Hawass explained how these doors were first found. A robot designed for this expedition was sent inside the shafts of the queen's chamber to find out what was there. The research team attached a camera to the robot. The footage revealed that behind the stone door, there was another sealed door. The archaeologists were thrilled to see this door instead of just a dead end. The structure of the stone door blocks the other doors perfectly. Experts think it's an incredible bit of engineering. Now, it's not possible to reach the door because it's behind a huge stone block. But archaeologists are trying to find a way to get there without damaging other parts of the structure. These new discoveries have only raised more questions instead of answering the already existing ones. Secrets are still waiting to be revealed. Our final stop is the Taj Mahal, a monument to love. Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan made this memorial to honor the memory of his beloved wife, Mumtaz Mahal. The total number of doors in the Taj Mahal is so great, this video would be days long if we started talking about all the sealed rooms. Experts think that if someone opened these doors after they've been closed for so long, it released carbon monoxide. And when this gas meets the marble, it forms calcium carbonate. That's why this could lead to the appearance of cracks in the minarets of the Taj Mahal. Also, a legend says that if these doors get open, a dreadful curse will be unleashed from the mausoleum's underground chambers. And here's a bonus from Canada. The door of room 873. This is a room at the Fairmont Banff Springs Hotel, which opened in 1888. The story goes like this. Decades ago, someone committed a crime in this room. After the investigation, the hotel administration refurbished the room and rented it out to other travelers. But rumor has it, other guests who stayed in the room later also faced unpleasant situations. They reported hearing strange noises. The TV in the room kept flickering. It's guessed that the door of room 873 was sealed with bricks. Curious guests who heard these mysterious stories wander along the corridor where the room used to be and knock on the walls to contact potential ghosts. Well, which of these secret doors would you like to open? 
Wow, talk about noisy! Toadfish have a unique ability. They can create a very strong sound. The human ear usually can't hear it, especially if only one fish is making the sound. But if many fish are making the sound at the same time, well, it's going to be hard to forget, and you may not be able to stop hearing it. Toadfish are a common part of the fauna off the coast of Sausalito in California. And every year, thousands of them gather in the shoals to party and… scream? Together, they create a collective sound that can be easily heard by those in the houses near the shore. The noise, which can be described as a low hum, can even penetrate into the city center. Some people get bothered by this constant humming. This is a unique natural phenomenon, but there's a catch. At some point, the fish swim away from the shore, but the sound remains. Also, scientists have proven that this fish-made noise can't spread through the city, and many residents of the coastal areas don't hear it. But still, some people continue to hear this strange hum. In a similar case, imagine that you've moved to a small village in Scotland. You rent a house, have dinner, and go to bed. As you're settling into sleep, a strange hum permeates your room. It sounds like someone started their truck somewhere in the distance. The sound is similar to the sound of a low, loud bass that comes from a speaker. The hum keeps you awake. You get migraines and even feel nauseous. In the morning, you find out that some other locals also hear this terrible buzzing. They tell you about a huge factory located nearby. Machines, engines, steam boilers, big air vents, and generators emit a loud, heavy hum that passes through the air. Sound waves spread throughout the village and annoy people with a sharp sense of hearing. You've been hearing this sound for several days and suffering from insomnia. Then, one day, the factory goes bankrupt. All the workers leave their positions and turn off all the engines and fans. Great, you'll finally sleep in peace. But you know what? The sound doesn't disappear. It follows you wherever you are. And it's not about the factory or the fish or the truck engine. Imagine that you're walking down the streets of a small English town. There are a lot of planes flying right above you. The hum they make follows you. Even in bed, you can hear it. You wonder if there's an airport nearby. You ask the locals and find out there's not even a runway here. But where does the sound come from? You raise your head to look up and see a clear sky. There are no planes, but there's noise. And you're not the only one who hears it. Some locals are sure that the hum comes from high-speed traffic on the highway. Thousands of cars drive in two directions and leave massive sound waves behind. But at night, there are no cars there, and the sound remains. Maybe you're going mad. People's stories about the hum save you from this madness, and it's not just the residents of this town that know about it. About 4% of people on the planet hear the hum. Strangers tell each other about the hum that prevents them from sleeping and concentrating on something. The sound follows them everywhere and doesn't stop. Some people hear it in certain places, so they move to other cities. Maybe you're hearing it right now and not paying attention. But be careful! If you recognize it once, you won't be able to stop hearing it. There's a website and a forum on the internet dedicated to the hum. People from all over the world put geolocations in places where they heard this mysterious phenomenon. You can find thousands of these coordinates on the site and even add your own. People describe different levels of noise and share their sources. Some theories say that the hum is the sound of our planet coming from the core. Someone else is sure that it comes from the atmosphere. Scientists have even been consulted, but they also don't know the reason for this phenomenon. People use high-frequency microphones and amplifiers to record the hum. Almost everywhere, they detect a low-frequency vibration that is practically impossible for the human ear to catch. It mixes with the sound of cars, printers in the office, and subway trains. Sometimes people stop hearing it, but the hum increases when they lie in bed. Many records about the hum say that people hear it in industrial cities. Sometimes these sound seekers manage to find the source. They ended up being factories with running generators where the sound was getting into the ventilation system and where the fans spread it outside the building. When the generator stopped working, the sound disappeared. But these are rare cases. More often, no one can find the source of hum. One of the most famous places where you can catch it is in the city of Taos in New Mexico. About 2% of locals hear a strange buzzing every day. Some tourists experience it too. 
Scientists came to the city to study this mystery, but found no explanation. Some theories say the usual acoustics of this place caused the hum. Some folks think it's just a hallucination or the power of suggestion. Everyone talks so much about the hum that the brain creates an illusion of a sound that doesn't exist. Locals believe the nature of the buzzing is mystical and associated with bad spirits. Whatever it is, no one has found out the truth yet. The hum that people hear all over the world may be the result of seismic activity in the tectonic plates under the ocean waters. Huge chunks of the Earth's crust are slowly moving and colliding with each other. This creates a noise that reaches us in the form of a hum. But why do only a few people hear it? Perhaps about 4% of the world's population has a unique sense of hearing. In any case, scientists haven't been able to confirm the tectonic plate theory either. Some researchers point to submarines as the reason. They use low-frequency radio signals to communicate around the world. These signals spread over the surface and can affect the human body. When the ear catches these sound waves, it reacts and causes vibrations similar to humming. This happens because low-frequency sound energy collides with the soft tissues of the skull and stimulates the auditory nerve. In fact, it's not even a sound. It's a hallucination that is created by your brain. But still, no one can confirm this theory either. Perhaps thunderstorms can create the hum phenomenon. About 8 million lightning strikes hit the Earth every day. Some impact creates a powerful electromagnetic charge. Lightning penetrates the air and makes it resonate between the Earth's surface and the ionosphere. Mmm, yeah, it sounds complicated, but the principle is simple. Imagine that you're blowing onto the neck of a bottle. Hear this low hum? Lightning works similarly with air. And that's just one hit. Imagine millions of these strikes. The sound waves spread all over the planet, and some people hear them. Lightning constantly strikes all the time, so the hum never stops. In 1973, scientists put forward a theory that the reason for the hum is the jet stream shearing against slower-moving air. In simple words, wind and fast air flows intersect slower ones. As a result, a whistling sound appears, and electric towers and power lines amplify it. By the way, the first reports of the hum appeared in the 70s. People learned about this phenomenon from the small British city of Bristol. Dozens of residents heard this strange noise in different parts of the town. In the beginning, they ignored it. Then the sound became increasingly more irritable. It prevented people from working and living their everyday lives. They couldn't sleep and couldn't concentrate on anything. There was a warehouse with industrial fans in a neighboring town. The locals were sure that this was the reason for the hum. The warehouse stopped working a few years later, but the sound remained. You may even be able to hear it right now if you visit the city. There are many theories about the hum, but you can reduce almost half of them thanks to one factor. Tectonic plates, seismic activity, lightning strikes, the Earth's crust, and resonating air are logical explanations. But look at all the records about the noise. People hadn't mentioned this until the 70s. If this phenomenon had appeared earlier, many newspapers would have written about it. Apparently, the hum is not a mystery of nature. Perhaps this is a consequence of all of our technological achievements. Factories, power lines, airplanes, cars, ship, trains, microwaves, and generators create an imperceptible background noise that most people ignore. We're so used to all these noises that we have forgotten what silence is. Perhaps our brain made the hum inside our heads to respond to our noisy world. If you start to listen carefully right now, what kind of sounds will you hear? Where are they coming from? And is there the hum among them? In 1945, Five TBF Avenger aircraft took flight for a routine training exercise around the Bermuda Triangle. In the middle of the exercise, the planes were struck by intense rain and heavy winds, despite the clear weather forecast. The pilots became extremely disoriented and radioed the base to report that their navigational equipment had stopped working. The last thing the base heard was, when the first plane drops below 10 gallons, we'll all go down together, and then static. The five planes and their 14 crew members were never seen or heard from again. On his very first voyage to the New World in 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed through the Bermuda Triangle. Columbus reported that one night when he was on the deck of the ship, 
he noticed a giant light appear in the distance, unlike anything he had ever seen before. Columbus looked at his compass for direction, and it gave off erratic readings. You might have noticed that the Bermuda Triangle doesn't appear on any world map. This is because official institutions refuse to acknowledge that the area actually exists. A popular theory suggests that rogue waves are responsible for the many disappearances. Rogue waves are called extreme storm waves by scientists. They occur when different weather patterns take place at the same time and cause large unexpected waves. Witnesses say that the waves look like giant walls of water. These waves could explain why ships go down fast and without leaving any trace. The Bermuda Triangle is home to some pretty intense and unexpected weather. Storms build up quickly and unexpectedly, then disappear soon after. If you blink, you might miss it. This could explain why few distress signals are issued. Pilots and sailors never saw the weather coming. No one knows exactly how many ships and planes have disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle. The rough estimate is 50 ships and 20 planes. Most of the time, the disappearances had no explanation and no wreckage has ever been left behind. Another bizarre theory trying to solve the Bermuda Triangle mystery comes from Charlie Berlitz. He insists that the area is home to the lost city of Atlantis. The missing ships and planes and malfunctioning equipment, according to him, were all caused by rays of energy let out by the special energy crystals that power Atlantis. While this sounds silly, Berlitz's theory was convincing enough that over 20 million people bought his book worldwide. In the year 1800, a large sailing vessel called the USS Pickering departed from the U.S. on its way to the West Indies. The ship sailed into the Bermuda Triangle along with its 90-man crew and was never heard from again. The USS Pickering was the first ever confirmed ship to vanish in the Bermuda Triangle. It's believed that the ship was taken out by a storm, but because no wreckage was ever found, we'll never know for sure. When the TBF Avenger planes went missing, a massive search operation was conducted. Boats and planes searched the Bermuda Triangle for any signs of the aircraft. One of the boats searching was a PBM-5 Mariner airboat. The airboat took flight at 7.27 p.m. and called in a routine radio message three minutes later. Then, it was never heard from again. No trace was ever found of the rescue airboat or the five Avenger aircraft. An enormous investigation was launched into the disappearance of all these vehicles, but nothing was ever discovered. This particular area of the ocean is one of the most heavily traveled shipping routes in the world. Some skeptics believe that this fact solves the mystery. Statistically, the busier the area, the higher the frequency of accidents and disappearances. While this makes sense, it's not the frequency of disappearances that's responsible for the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle. It's the lack of explanation or wreckage found. On the ocean floor, decomposing organisms let off large concentrations of methane gas that gets trapped under the water. This gas can build up until, boom, it ruptures. The gas surges up to the surface and erupts. If a ship was in the area of one of these ruptures, the water would become much less dense and cause the ship to sink rapidly and without warning. Scientists believe this could be the cause of the many disappearances in the Bermuda Triangle. While this theory makes a lot of sense, it doesn't seem too likely. The U.S. Geological Survey has stated that no large releases of gas are believed to have occurred in this area for the past 15,000 years. The ocean floor is made of rocks containing a lot of magnetite. It's more like iron. Magnetic fields react to high concentrations of magnetite on the ocean floor, which may start a sort of conflict between the two. It can often lead to various weather anomalies and, as a result, navigation issues. And naturally, any changes in the ocean floor or the Earth's magnetic fields influence the Bermuda Triangle a lot. Since the magnetic field is constantly moving, it might be also taking the Bermuda Triangle with it. Now that people know where the triangle is, it's easy to avoid it. It supposedly moves eastward together with the magnetic poles. But scientists still can't answer where exactly it will be in a couple of years. Some people blame all the disasters on the extraterrestrial paranormal activity. Others suppose it's all about raging natural phenomena. 
There's another triangle in Lake Michigan. Just like the one near Bermuda, the Michigan Triangle got its shady reputation for some disappearances. The first recorded one dates back to 1679. A large vessel, one of the largest of that time, set out on an expedition. Yet, once it got in the sinister triangle, it never came back. Much later, an aircraft disappeared in this triangle. The skies are usually very clear there, but back in 1883, some people witnessed abnormal things in the area. Some claim to have seen large blocks of ice falling from the skies, and the crew even managed to save one as hard proof. Meanwhile, the Pacific Ocean mystery area is another sinister triangle. Off the south coast of Japan, not far away from Tokyo, there's a sea where plenty of ships met their doom, disappearing without a trace in these waters. They call it the Devil's Triangle. Some scientists believe the cause of anomalies is the environmental changes. Also, there's a really high concentration of methane hydrates on the bottom of the ocean in the Pacific Triangle area. You're deviating from your original course and sailing in the wrong direction. There's the Caribbean Sea near the triangle peppered with small islands. The seafloor here isn't deep. The ship can get in shallow waters. And now the ship is stuck on a shoal and you have no idea where you are. If this were the 21st century, the ship's captain would be able to reach the shore using GPS and other modern navigation. But the most interesting thing is that the compass would work correctly this time, since the magnetic north pole hasn't already coincided with the true one for a long time in the territory of the Bermuda Triangle. The Agonic Line is somewhere far away from here. There are no problems with navigation now. But for some reason, this is where ships disappear. In fact, not just here. Throughout the Atlantic Ocean, there are places where many more ships were gone. The Bermuda Triangle is not even in the top 10 of such places. One of the main reasons why many ships are lost here is that one of the most popular shipping routes in the Atlantic passes through the Bermuda Triangle. And the more ships in one place, the more shipwrecks. Simple probability. Then, it just starts getting weird. Other theories say that there's a space-time rift in this region. Ships and planes fall into this rift and end up in the past or the future. But for some reason, there's not a single proof of this myth. There's no reason to think that the rift is hidden somewhere here. The base of an extraterrestrial civilization is located in the Bermuda Triangle. Visitors from other galaxies steal sea vessels along with the crew, so no one finds the wreckage of the ships. This is also a popular myth that has no scientific justification. The Kraken lives somewhere in the triangle. It's a huge squid that sinks ships and also is a legend that sailors tell each other. However, gigantic squids live in the depths of the ocean. They can grow to the size of a half a train car, but no cases have ever been recorded where they sunk a large vessel. And in the area of the Bermuda Triangle, they have never ever been seen. People in the past didn't know about the existence of these creatures. So when they saw them for the first time, they described them as huge, terrible monsters. Giant squids are some of the most elusive creatures on Earth, and scientists had to use sonar equipment to find them. They don't like to leave the dark depths and are likely to be afraid of the sound of any ship. So that should squash the squid as a suspect. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright